So we are continuing on with finding limits analytically. And in our previous lecture, we looked at things that we're allowed to do with limits, right? The properties of limits. And also we talked about direct substitution. So I wanted to give us basic, this is my strategy that I usually give students for how to distinguish a limit, okay? So the first thing that I do, if I'm given this limit as x approaches c of f of x, is the first thing I do is I plug in the c, okay? If I get out a number, right, then that's my limit. It's just equal to that number, then I'm finished. Now if I don't get out a number, if I'm dividing by zero or I get something else, then we need a different strategy. And so today we're going to talk about those different strategies, okay? And so this is basically the procedure you go through. First, you try direct substitution. If you get your number out, then that means it's continuous there and you're finished. If direct substitution fails, so there's a couple of cases here. So sometimes, right, I get zero in both of these denominators, but there's a different, these are different cases. If I get zero over zero, then that's what we call indeterminate form. That actually is not zero. That means that there's more algebra to be done. Okay, there's usually an algebra trick and that's what we're gonna talk about next. So if I get zero over zero, then I get indeterminate form. So it's always good to plug in your value first to see what you get out. If you get a number where a isn't zero, right? If I get a over zero, then this is an indication that C, this line x equals C, is a vertical asymptote. Do you remember when we were working with the rational functions and we would simplify them, and whatever was left over in the denominator, whatever made that zero was my vertical asymptote. This is the back implication of it. If I end up with division by zero and it's not a zero on top, right, it's a number divided by zero, that's an implication that that value C that we were approaching is a vertical asymptote which means I can immediately stop trying to figure out what the number is because it's going to be an infinite limit. Because if you remember what the behavior of graphs are around vertical asymptotes is they're usually either going straight up, right, to infinity we say, or straight down to negative infinity. And so at that point, if we want to know the right and the left hand behavior, we can look at each one and figure out is it going to positive or negative infinity. But it's not going to approach a specific number, it's going to be an infinite limit, okay. So we're gonna come back up here. So those are the three things that happen. I can plug in my number, I can get out, I have my value for C, I can get out a number and then I'm finished with my limit. I get that number. I plug in the number, I get zero over zero and then we're gonna learn some algebra tricks of how to simplify it. Or if I get a number over zero, then I know my limit is infinite. And then if I want to, I can look at the right and the left hand behavior and see, okay, are they both going to infinity? Is one going to infinity? Is one going to negative infinity? And so forth, okay. So let's look at our first case of an algebra trick, okay? Well, actually, let's first talk about this. So we need this idea first. So it's about functions that agree at all but one point. Now, again, when we were working with rational functions, we were doing this. So if f, if f of x is equal to g of x for all x not equal to c, then if the limit as g of x exist as x approaches c, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists, and they are equal. So this is the, the what we were doing when we were, when you were working with rational functions, and I said you needed to simplify them first and basically, you know, cancel out the common factors. That is a case of where f and g are the same except for at that one place, okay? So for instance, if I had the limit as x approaches 1, of x minus 1, x plus 2, I'm just going to use the factored one, right? Then really, right, when I plug in 1 here, I am getting division by 0, but when I plug in 1 on the top, I also get 0 because 0 times whatever this is is 0. So this is an indeterminate form. But I can simplify these two factors. And if I look at these two functions, if I look at this function, right, on its own, and I looked at this original function on its own, the two graphs would be indistinguishable, except for, well, wait a minute, let me actually put the two down here. I'm not sure how that changed to three. The two graphs would be exactly the same, except for when I looked right around the one, I would get that undefined space. But other than that, the two graphs are identical. 
through if you could, if you don't remember go back and watch that again because there was the one graph where it just changed color because it looked identical it was just the fact that at that one spot around here in this case it would be one where when I go to t at one everything is perfect it looks like it's all filled in but when I look right at that spot there's a little hole there so these are two functions that agree at all at one except for at C right there they are exactly the same except for right there at one and so that means that if this limit exists then this limit also exists and now this is a continuous right normally like this is one where I could use direct substitution so I plug in the one and I get negative two on top and I get three on the bottom and so that's my limit so since this limit right is equal to this then that means that this limit up here is also equal to this because they are two functions that agree all except for at x equals one okay so our first strategy then for simplifying so the first thing we always want to do is check do I have indeterminate form and so I want to plug in the two and when I plug in the two I get four plus four which is eight minus eight so I get zero in the top and then when I put the two in the bottom I get four minus six which is negative two plus two which is zero so this is indeterminate form I get zero over zero when I plug it in that does not mean it's zero that means that there's an algebra trick that we can do and just like we saw before when I have a rational function like this then factoring is my best friend and so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor the top and the bottom now you notice I'm writing this limit as x approaches 2 every time and so I want to factor these so uh, this is x plus 4 x minus 2 in the top all over x minus 2 x minus 1 in the bottom all right so now I can simplify these two okay so if this new limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 4 over x minus 1 exists then that is the same as this limit because this function if I graph it will look identical to this function except for right there at x equals 2 see how that we get this common factor right if you're having trouble if you have trouble factoring if I get 0 over 0 and I am approaching 2 then if you kind of go back that backwards thing then x minus 2 must be a factor in both so that can help you factor as well so now I can plug in the two once I'm plugging in numbers I'll just put equal and I'm gonna get 6 over 1 which is 6 and that's my limit right so that's when I'm dealing with something that will factor right and I get 0 over 0 irrational functions I should factor them simplify the common factors and then use direct substitution so that's my first approach when I get 0 over 0 is if I have something that looks like it'll factor then I should factor it okay so we have this one requires a different strategy so limits that require that have a radical in them so again I should make sure I'm in indeter indeterminate form because if I'm not I don't need to go through all the algebra I just plug in the number so if I plug in 0 here then I get the square root of 1 which is 1 minus 1 which is 0 and then I plug in 0 on the bottom I'm gonna get 0 so I do have indeterminate form so that means there's an algebra trick and when it involves a radical like this then we employ a strategy of right this is a, a limit isn't equal to anything on the other side so I can't just divide or multiply by things unless it's like I'm multiplying by 1 and so a strategy that we use for <laughs> radicals is to multiply <laughs> all right so our second example of a type of limit that we can um, use algebra for is the limit as x approaches zero of a radical x plus one minus one over x okay so the limits that involve a radical that are in indeterminate form and when I plug in I can tell because I plug in 0 and I'm gonna get 1 minus 1 over which is 0 over 0 so I get indeterminate form then what I want to do right so limits are not equal to anything right I wrote that there this is equal to 0 over 0 which is indeterminate form but it's not like this is equal to 2 when I can just multiply both sides by something it's not right this is like it's kind of standing on its own it's not equal to anything so when I 
alter it, I need to alter it in a way that I'm not changing it. So I can't just multiply by anything, I can't just divide by anything, unless I'm multiplying and dividing by one. And so that's what we want to do. So I'm rewriting this, and the strategy for involving a radical is to multiply by what is called the conjugate, and we do the top and the bottom. The conjugate is exactly the same piece like this, except we're the, between the radical and the number, the sign changes. So if this had been plus 1 already, then the conjugate would be the square root of x minus 1. But this, the conjugate in this case is x plus 1, nothing changes under the radical, and then plus 1. So it's just the opposite. What I'm doing here is I'm creating the difference of two squares here. And I'm going to multiply this again by the same thing in the bottom because that way I'm multiplying by 1 and not by something else. So I can't change it. All right. Now the key to this. Now sometimes the radical is in the numerator and sometimes it's in the denominator. The key to figuring this out is to only multiply the part, right? This is the conjugate of this. This is the only part we're going to multiply together is the top. The bottom we're just going to let sit next to each other because if I start multiplying things, I'm going to miss the beauty of what's going to happen next, the algebra. Okay, so I'm going to multiply, right? I'm foiling here really because I have a binomial times a binomial. So when I multiply the square root of x plus 1 times the square root of x plus 1, I get the square root of x plus 1 quantity squared, which squares away my radical. So I get x plus 1, and now my middle term is negative square root of x plus 1, and then I get a plus 1 square root of x plus 1. So my middle terms go away. That's why I like this. That's why I'm doing this, is because my radical middle terms cancel each other out. That's what happens when you multiply. Essentially, this is like the difference of two perfect squares. It's just like if you factored x squared minus 9 to be x plus 3x minus 3 because there's no middle term. All right, so then my last one is negative 1 times positive 1, so I get minus 1 in the top. The bottom, I'm just rewriting as it is. I'm not multiplying it in any way. I just let it sit. Ooh, I should put my limit in here as x approaches 0. All right, so now the top, right? is just simplifies to x and okay so I have this x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1 this is all parentheses and so now right the the thing that is really causing the division by 0 is this x down here right and so now when I simplify this x with this x because I can because it's multiplication then I really get the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. And now when I plug in 0 in the denominator, I don't actually have 0 anymore. So now I can use direct substitution, and I get 1 over, when I plug in 0, I get the square root of 1, which is 1 plus 1, and I end up with a half. Okay, so this is what happens. This is a strategy that I can use when I am when I have a radical in my limit. Okay, this is called multiplying by the conjugate. All right, and so the last type that we're going to talk about right now is, <clears throat> so I plug in my h again, and I'm going to get, or I plug in 0 for h, and I'm going to get x squared minus x squared, right? If I open these parentheses, right, I plug in the h is 0, and so then I have x quantity squared, so I get x squared minus x squared, which is 0, over when I plug in h is 0, I get 0. And so the thing to do here is if, in fact, I have algebra that I can do, then I should do it. See how these parentheses are in here? I want to get rid of them. So I have the limit as h approaches 0 of, let me get rid of these. Now I'm remembering that I'm. this is really this, right? Just like, so this is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, when I multiply it all out, minus x squared over h. And this should look familiar, right? Remember when we were doing the difference quotient? Okay, so now my x squareds cancel each other out, and I have the limit as h approaches 0 of 2xh plus h squared over h. And 
I can factor out, right? The, the end goal for these, to keep your eye on the prize, is to make sure that whatever this thing is in the bottom that's making it zero cancels it out. And so I want this H to cancel with something. And so I notice here that I can factor out an H on the top. So I have h times 2x plus h all over h. And now I have this simplifying, and now I plug in h is 0. And this time I get a variable, but my, my limit is actually 2x, right? And x isn't happening. It's just a constant. And so as h approaches 0, I end up with 2x. And so this is my limit.